Hi, folks. I want to talk to you a bit about designing for security outcomes. But the first thing I have to say is that we've made a terrible, terrible mistake. It turns out that security actually has very little to do with computers. Security is not something that we get from well-functioning computers. It's something that has much more to do with humans. Security is the set of activities that reduce the likelihood of some set of adversaries, the people who don't like you or want to stop you from, or your users from doing what they want to do. You know, it's the thing that stops those adversaries from stopping the users from doing what they want to do. There are no computers in this definition. If your users are doing things with computers, then computers enter the picture somewhere, but they enter the picture fairly late once you have figured out what people are trying to do. So when we divide up um, the security task and the part of the security task that you guys as, as part of product teams deal with, we've got kind of four components, right? Tech is where we tend to think of security being, like that's, it's, security is a technical problem. Technically, security is actually a mostly solved problem with a few really interesting exceptions like fundamental trust routes and a few other things. Um, the largest one of those exceptions is legacy platforms. Everything is a legacy platform. Um, the, the really brief rundown on this for me is stop using, um, stop writing your own crypto, stop writing your own parsers, forklift upgrade the world, listen to the people at langsec.org. That's about as much as I have to say about technical security. Um, process, you know, we keep getting told security is a process, and this is actually very hard. This is one of the things that we're not very good at because this is one of the places where humans live. We're getting better, measuring, measuring all of the things, understanding what you should be measuring. Uh, one of the keynotes yesterday talked a bit about uh, including sales data and you know, corporate process data in the same thing that you include technical data. If you don't do that, you don't understand what your users are trying to do and whether or not they're succeeding. That is, again, at the core of security. And then design is what we're here to actually talk about. So the reason why we talk about security design, this is our traditional understanding of kind of what the stack of a system looks like. You've got some task that the user is trying to accomplish that translates into a task in the system, that translates through some system architecture, and then it gets implemented, and then there are bugs. We got that backwards, right? The bugs happen in the user task, right? The bugs impact someone who's trying to do a thing. And if you don't design from the user task forward for security, that's where you get the problems. So security design is the process of understanding user culture the goals that users have, their workflows, the technical capabilities of your delivery organization as far as what you can actually provide for, what your adversaries' capabilities are as far as trying to interfere with all of this or your users' adversaries, and when they're likely to use what capabilities, and synthesizing a solution that works through all of these different constraints. So uh, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many people here have built or used a, a threat model? Show of hands? Wow, that's more than I would expect. That makes me really happy. That's still a terrifyingly small part of the audience. So for everyone else, a threat model is a formal, complete, human-readable model of the activities and priorities and security-relevant features of a system. Now, I say a few things here in part because a lot of people do threat modeling. A lot of people do threat modeling very badly. If your threat model can't tell you when you're finished modeling, whether or not it's complete and whether or not it's internally consistent, it's not a threat model. It's more of a threat list. Um, and we see a lot of threat listing out there. So a good threat model you can use to ask questions about how the system will work. And you can use to ask questions both at the requirements level and at the architecture level. So this is a really, really high level summary of kind of what a threat model should do for you. It gives you a model of the requirements of the system, what you're trying to do. It gives you a model of the architecture of the system, how you're trying to do those things. From the requirements model, you get the security objectives. How is this system supposed to function? How is it supposed to break? Under what conditions should it respond? In what ways? To what kinds of malicious activities? And from the architecture model, you get all of the places where you might violate those security objectives. If you've got these things covered, then you've got something like a threat model, assuming that you can use it to actually answer questions. So let's put this in context. So this is your kind of traditional, yes, I know, very waterfall, very big, you know, big design up front, whatever. Um, you know, this is your traditional security process. And if you're agile, it still works roughly the same way. These are what we think of as kind of the traditional security tasks. 
So you start with architectural analysis, you know, to, to figure out, you know, is the, is the architecture that we've come up to satisfy these requirements going to work? Then you have standards and frameworks that drive how you're writing code, you know, ideally that get all of your, all of your protocol parsing, all of, all of that kind of stuff out of the hands of normal developers so you don't have to think about it or touch it. Um, you have security testing once you get to test, and once you're in operations, you have monitoring and instant response. And, you know, you can shift these around, whatever stuff moves around a little bit, but that's basically what you're looking at. What threat modeling done right does is it overlays over all of this. It's where you start doing requirements analysis. You start getting an idea of, hey, are these, can we actually deliver these requirements securely? Um, one of the most terrible engagements that I had, I've, I've had a, a long career in enterprise security and, and doing uh, consulting audits. One of the most terrible engagements that I had was we went through and did requirement analysis for a major Fortune 500 company and eventually had to tell them, so this product that you're two months from shipping, you have a fundamental conflict in the requirements. You've said that you must maintain confidentiality on X and that users must be able to share X. And this is the entire point of this product. And you can't do this. And they closed the division and fired a lot of people. That was an incredibly expensive bug. This is why you do threat modeling when you start, so you don't have bugs that are that expensive. Um, it, does, it takes the place of and supplements a lot of your architectural analysis. It tells developers, what are the requirements when I'm developing this module or this chunk of code? What do I actually need to do to do this securely? Um, it drives all of your tests. It says, OK, these are all the things I need to test. These are all the things that are not low level, like language issues that I need to test. And then it prioritizes and you know, helps orient your incident response teams as far as what systems are important and what data is important. Um, so the next thing we get is security design. Because the thing that was missing on this is how do you understand if your requirements for a technical system actually meet what your users are trying to do. And that's not obvious. You know, it's, it's often really quite difficult. The number of, uh, how many people here use PGP? I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, this is why PGP is still for, you know, so much work has gone into it. It's still a terrible solution because it's actually a really bad fit for what the human beings who are trying to use these systems need. So, Adversary modeling and participatory design are kind of the two foundation activities. And on top of them, we build security design. And this is, you know, from this, we'll go and talk a little bit about what does security design look like at a process at a, a fairly high level. But the goal of all of these things is intent transfer, right? The idea is that you have, your users have some intent. They have a thing that they want to get done in the world. They have adversaries that they're worried about. And you need to accurately capture that intent in full detail. And you need to transfer it down every stage of the operations and deployment and development stack. And if you, if you screw up at any point and you, you don't actually deliver intent, you know, something gets lost at some stage, that's bugs, right? And that's bugs. And the, the further up it gets lost, the worse it is. So there are a bunch of different versions of this curve, of this cost curve. Um, I forget exactly which chunk of data I drew this one. I'm, I'm sorry for having unsighted numbers up here. Um, you know, the multiplier ranges from 30x to several thousand x, depending on whose data you look at. Um, you know, as, as you go through each of these stages, the earlier you find a bug, if you find your bug in requirements, or you cause a bug in requirements and you fix it and find it at the architecture level, you know, that's one chunk of cost. If you don't fix it until you're already deployed and in operations, it's terrible. So the, the issue with things like security design and threat modeling, if you don't do these processes, if you don't have a threat model, then you don't have the visibility to find architecture bugs, right? You're not going to find those bugs until probably deployment, you know, pre-deployment testing, maybe if you're lucky code, but really, you'd prefer to find architecture bugs while you're still developing architecture. That's why you do threat modeling in architecture. Security design is the same thing for requirements. A threat model may find requirements bugs, but only once you're off in architecture, off your, you know, once you have developed your requirements, you know, it's a bit late and it's more expensive. So if we want to think about security for humans, how do we have to change our understanding, right? We have this kind of baked-in understanding of, right, security is a process, it's a technical process, it involves 
you know, testing tools and whatever, that's not really about the humans. So how do we think about that? The first thing to understand is that outcomes are messy. Um, we have this idea that we're going to provide assurance around security. Like, we're going we're to go out there and we're going to make sure that this system will not fail. It's a lie. It's a really nice lie. It's an incredibly lucrative lie. Like, man, the security industry has made so much money off of selling people assurance that we can't deliver on. It's great. I mean, not the part where we screw a lot of people by promising things we can't deliver, but, you know, whatever. Um, so the, thing, the first thing to accept, especially when you're looking at human outcomes, is that you're not going to be able to fix everything, right? So I do a lot of work in the high-risk world um, dealing with NGOs and news organizations that are specifically targeted by nation states. And, you know, if, if you're operating in a country where journalists get shot for reporting the news, then sometimes your users get shot, and that sucks, and it doesn't matter what security support you give them, because that is an inherent problem in the structure that you're dealing with. Um, and you have to accept kind of some of that mess if you're, if you're willing to look at what users do, but if you don't look at what users do, you don't get to see it. Um, and I talk about high-risk users a lot when I'm, when I'm talking to audiences like this, because talking to them makes all of the planning and all of the structure of the security problem for users a lot more explicit. So we have this, the, the basic problem we're dealing with is planning in the presence of an adversary, right? How do I figure out what I'm going to do when someone is trying to stop me? So this is an OODA loop. Um, there's a guy, Colonel John Boyd, who's an Air Force colonel, and this is a basic model of kind of how one side of a, of a conflict thinks in any conflict. You can change the steps, you can't really change the order, but some, some models split it out a bit, some combine them. Um, observe, orient, decide, act. Observe the world around you, orient yourself within it, figure out your possible courses of action and your adversary's likely courses of action, decide on a course of action, do that, immediately go back to observing. There's a notion, um, and this is coming from, this is coming from dogfighting and, and fighter planes, and there's an idea in, in dogfighting, you try and turn inside your enemy, right? If you can turn faster than they can, you're gonna win the dogfight. And the same thing applies to this. So all else being equal, and of course it's never equal, but if all else were suddenly to become equal, if you can execute that loop more quickly at the same depth than your opponent, you can outthink them. So speed is very important in many adversarial situations. Now there's a lot of other stuff going on, right? This is your whole operational planning task. You've got a whole bunch of different domains that you're dealing with. Um, and you notice that, like, Digital practices, all of the stuff that we think of as security is one tiny little corner of this big problem. And that's why the first thing that we have to think about when we're dealing with, you know, working and designing for operational planning is cognitive overhead, right? Your users have a very limited amount of brain space to think about security and to think about how they're going to plan what they're going to do, even when they're thinking about it explicitly, right? Even when you're lucky enough to have users who are really engaged with the security problem. This is quite rare. But even those guys still don't have that much time. So you need to reduce cognitive overhead as much as possible. Because fundamentally, what we're talking about is efficacy, right? We're talking about, can they get the things that they're trying to do done? If they can't get their work done, it doesn't matter how secure their system is. Um, what do you call a journalist who's, you know, fully secure in every possible way? Not a journalist anymore. They're a security hobbyist. Um, and in a lot of cases, this is where we get worse is better, right? If you have a system that results in better outcomes, in terms of people getting more work done at a risk that they can accept, it doesn't matter that it's less secure because they've made that balance point. You can't make that judgment for them. So what do we mean by secure? We mean things that the system will maintain without changing, right? So here are some invariants that systems might try and maintain that you're probably at least somewhat familiar with, right? So these are the kinds of things that we're going to design for, that we're going to build into a system that we're going to ensure that can't be violated as the structure changes. Now, this is a few invariants that are kind of we think about a lot. This is a slightly more full list of invariants. There are a lot of different properties that you can try to build a system to support that impact the way users work in the world, as opposed to just the way the computers work. Now, 
every single invariant that you build has some ceremony that you need to maintain it, you know? So you wanna preserve the secrecy of the meeting, so you put on your big deep hoods and you walk out into the woods and you have your meeting by candlelight or whatever, you know? But all of these things, you have to, you have to do something because they change the way you plan, they change the way you schedule meetings, they change the way you do whatever, right? Very rare, it's very rare that you can actually have a system that you just give people a thing and it doesn't change what they need to do at all. Which means that every new invariant is a task that you've put on your users. They need to be able to see the invariant in the system, understand that it supports it, understand what that means, and detect when it fails. That is a very complicated UX task. The last thing to think of around this structure is that every single um, invariant occurs in the context of a community, right? Every single security problem occurs in the context of a community. Different people will take different roles. It's not like you just, you know, oh, we've shipped a tool and everyone uses the tool the same way. That never happens in real deployed scenarios. And that means that you need to deal with, you know, designing for different kinds of roles. So we talk about participatory design for this because it's a frame that gives us and gives our users the things that, that or lets them, lets them tell us what they need, right? And not lets them tell us, oh, I want a tool that does X, because they probably don't know what X should be, but it lets us recognize them as authorities on their goals, right? They understand what they need, and we listen to them. It lets us build deep, cultural engagement, right? A lot, of these, a lot of these scenarios are not simple. You need to understand what people are actually trying to do, and that's often not gonna be obvious. Um, for example, in uh, doing some work in Syria, we had a, an issue where people continued to use Skype for meetings, even though we'd given them some really great secure text messaging tools. Um, the issue turned out to be that the thing that they would do whenever they started a Skype call is show the room on the camera because it mattered more that they could say that there's no one else in the room with a gun compelling me to do this thing than whether or not their conversation was overheard. If you don't understand the cultural context in which a tool is being used, you cannot understand why some invariants that you think should matter do or don't matter. Tacit and embodied knowledge is a big deal. People don't necessarily know what they actually know about their situation. If you're gonna deploy tools that build new security properties, you need a huge amount of trust. You need to ship stuff early instead of shipping, you know, like fix the bugs early instead of shipping things that people can't use six months late. Um, you need to be able to create countermeasures that cross between on and offline. Um, security issues, and you need to minimize team ego. Kathy Sierra writes a bunch of really great stuff about this in Badass, about basically how to design for making your users better instead of making your tool cooler. So that's what I've got. I'm happy to talk more about this stuff. Uh, find me on Twitter, find me later. I'll be here all day. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>